So the other week when we did the stepping up from class four to class five podcast, I teased this video. I want to take a second to talk about the different techniques that I use to get people through their step up runs. So when I'm acting as an on the water coach or mentor and someone really needs that personal attention to get through their step up run, what are the different techniques that I use and how do I approach it? First of all, everyone's different. Everyone's got their own style and it really helps if you have a prior relationship with that person and that person's done their homework. I tend to want to work with people who I know and I trust and I know are ready. That is by far the best secret to success. Okay. So in this case, I'm taking my friend Hollis down. Hollis is a longtime friend of mine. They have been paddling class four and five with me in other places, but this is the Stone Valley to Raquette, very notorious section. And they weren't ready. They just weren't ready, but time had come and it was time to check this off their bucket list. So I'm going to discuss the different techniques I use because it's a good smattering and give you a look at how I do my thing. Now, please bear in mind before you go be a comment warrior that no, the ACA doesn't cover class five. There's a very good reason for it. You're going to see some of those reasons in this video. Um, if you're, you know, a perfectionist and you want to live in utopia, please, by all means, just go somewhere else. So before we even put on, Hollis is already pretty well set up for success. A, we both know this is within their wheelhouse. B, Hollis asked me beforehand, what are the moves I really need to be successful here? What are like the crux moves I need to practice? And I gave that feedback with plenty of time for them to work on those moves. I made a video guide for this river. Hollis has studied it, knows what to expect, knows what's coming, has an idea of what it's gonna look like when it's really happening. So all we gotta do is put the pieces together and adjust to the scale of this river, which is big. It's an intimidating place. So we've taken everything and set it up for success so that all you have to deal with is nerves. That's a great place to be. So technique one, just get out of their way. Get them started and go from eddy to eddy. So especially here, the initiation rapid is notoriously junky, hard to make look smooth. And you just come off of it feeling a little shaky. So the best thing that I can do is say, this rapid's kind of junky. I'll be down in the eddy that actually matters and give Hollis that time to put in, relax, process, take a deep breath and slide into the water. The other aspect of this is I'm making sure that I'm in the safety ID before an enormous horizon line. So that A makes Hollis feel safer and like I've got their back, but B, it also just gives me an opportunity to prevent an issue from happening and to point out the entrance from the water level. So when we go down and scout, the pieces start coming together. I told you it was weird and makey. You can see a little curler on the horizon line. Yeah. That's the entrance right there from one curler to the other curler. Okay. So technique two, Colton Falls. We are going to start off by scouting. So let's look at that. They either enter over here in a sort of a slack water yeah. or they ride that bloom all the way down and straight out. Uh, the important thing is that when you look at your landing, look how calm it is in there, okay? Yeah. So like, even if you somehow missed it completely and you were rolling and you came up, see the flake all the way out there? Yeah. That's where you gotta wind up. So even if you really screwed up, just get to that flake. That should be not so bad, right? Yeah. So notice we're having a conversation working off of prior knowledge. Hollis has been here, scouted this, seen it on video, knows what's going on. That's a best case scenario. What we're focusing on now is not so much the line as how long you're gonna have to get from the entrance to the crux move, to the setup eddy, to the big slide. By doing it this way, it's less about if you're gonna make it and more about 
how you're going to make it. And positioning it that way is very subtle, but has a huge impact on the other person. Now let's look at how to use other paddlers on the river to discuss a rapid. So we're going to see a good line immediately followed by a rough line. And you're going to see how we react to both of those and take data off of them. Oh, Tony's doing that one. Much slower than it looks, right? I struggle with worrying about myself and just letting Hollis or whoever's following me do what they got to do. Sometimes it's really takes you out of it. All right. So a bit of a camera malfunction here. I hit it twice and turned it off. So you're going to see me in the midway eddy waiting for Hollis to come down and giving some encouragement, cleaning things up. Notice I don't give Hollis a lot of time. This is a mix of personal teaching preference and knowing the person. I know that hanging out in this eddy is not a comfortable place for most people the way it might be for me. And what they really want to do is just finish the job at hand. So just take a breather. The worst part is now over. Okay. All right. So this silly flip on the bottom is actually super common for some people when they step up. This is usually a good indicator to me that they are overwhelmed, that they are just surviving and they basically checked out and said, Oh my God, thank God it's over. This is a great time. If you have the opportunity to give that person a minute to just take a breath, congratulate them, let them decompress and then move on. Technique number three. This is one of those rapids where it's jumbly and manky, but there's actually not much of a scouting opportunity. So rather than spend a lot of time of explaining it, what I'm going to tell Hollis is this is a hey diddle diddle down the middle. As long as you enter in the right place, watch for the key move and we're going to slide through. So now we're just in normal class five, just Relax. So see your flake. Now we've moved a couple rapids down and we're above something where the crux move is way downstream. You can scout it, but it doesn't give you a great angle. It sort of just makes more sense to run it out. Now, how am I making that decision? Because the actual hazard is extremely easy to avoid. And then once it's avoided, the rest of the rapids very safe. So what I'm going to do is explain the rapid, communicate with Hollis, make sure they know where we're going and then just let them follow me. So this one's narrow. This one's kind of like the right? Yeah, sort of. Once you like make it to that point, you're safe. And honestly, what it really is, is like a repeat of the Booth and Colton. It feels a lot more like that. Once you make it down the channel and you're approaching the booth, you are in safety. So just send it. The, the hazard is more like not knowing where you are and rolling off the right side into the hole. See the huge rock outcrop? on the center, yeah. that's going to be, your shoulder's going to be hanging underneath it. Okay. That's right where we're going. Okay. And you're going to see me like go into a tight chute. Once you're in that tight chute, the hazards are done 
and you just got a boost. It's a class three to, to there. Just follow me through. Now notice as I'm paddling into this section, I'm trying to go slow and smooth, but not so slow that the person behind me is forced to take backstrokes. Once I get to where I need to pick up, I'm gonna jet through and do the move, but until then, I'm just gonna make sure the person behind me feels like they're in control and can anticipate where I'm going. I'm going to do my best to point my boat exactly in the direction that I'm going, have very clear body language, and try to avoid giving any mixed signals so that they don't interpret something and freak out or make a bad decision. You got it, Hollis. Yeah, Hollis! As soon as Hollis lands, I just keep moving. Why do I do this? Because I don't want them to scramble. I don't want them ever to have to feel like they need to quickly catch and find an eddy or anything like that. I want them just to feel a little flowy and keep moving through. Since I know that Hollis has a very solid booth and there's no reason that they won't make this move behind me, I'm not gonna force them to react upon landing or try and interpret my movements while they're still up on the drop. I'm just gonna get out of the way, float down and trust them to make the move. The bigger concern is Tubbs is right down the road and I need to make sure that just like before we rolled into Colton, I'm in the staging eddy, clearly signaling where we're going next to keep the feelings and confidence high. Now, you're gonna see a completely different scenario play out here. Hollis is gonna bail, but we're gonna salvage it and make the most of the situation. Okay, so Tug, um, the most commonly walked one, I think, So, not a bad scenario to play out, right? A couple guys come down, prove my point. This is almost a best case scenario. Now I have a decision to make. There are gonna be scenarios where the person I'm guiding down chooses to walk, and for camaraderie and moral support and for the opportunity to maybe have a conversation, I will walk with them. But 
In this case, I decided it was more valuable for Hollis to see me smoke the move and register that what I was saying made sense, get to see my line versus the other line, and that this would ultimately build more confidence than simply walking with them. Because that would reinforce that maybe this drop was scarier than it really has to be. So the next draft that we're gonna look at is one where not everything goes perfectly. This is a situation that's akin to big water or something else where the rapid is long, not well scouted, relatively simple, but high consequence. So what do you do? You can spend a lot of time scouting, but in long rapids that move very quickly, it's very easy to confuse all your landmarks. In tubs, we were able to set a very precise, consistent landmark to work off, and that really simplified the whole rapid. But in particle accelerator, it's very simple to misidentify your landmarks and then through that, miss the line. Missing the line here has some pretty big consequences, so I don't want that to happen. What I would rather say is, listen, there's some green tongues, you need to keep your bow left. Don't lose sight of me, I'm gonna accelerate really quickly away from you. That's basically what I do here. And were the results perfect? No. Did everything wind up okay? Yes. Have I done that before? Would I do that again? Yes. Even though this didn't go perfectly, you gotta remember, Hollis scouting and then running it, I felt the odds were actually worse from personal experience. So you'll notice after this experience, I wanna make sure that Hollis still knows I have their back even though it didn't go well. That's super important. So we're communicating, we're talking about what went wrong. I'm giving and taking information. Hollis is giving and taking information. I'm learning what I can do better next time. Hollis is learning how to run the rapid better next time. <laughs> <laughs> this give and take is super important, not only to you so that you do better next time, but also to the person that you're teaching so they do better next time. So make sure you respect the process, give them time, don't say yeah, 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 and keep moving when the conversation kind of peters out. You also want to maintain that momentum of the day and keep them moving before they overthink their last mistake. In this case, there was a perfect scenario because the next rapid, I'm basically gonna go do the same thing. You really can't scout it, and it comes down to placement in a single move in a low consequence rapid. So let's play this game again. I'm gonna give a simple set of information for beta and have Hollis follow me in. I'm gonna do my best to clearly indicate where that move is and then just let them follow me through. That's gonna help not only rebuild that relationship a little bit, rebuild Hollis's confidence a little bit, but also just end the day on a high note. So I hope that helped give you a couple techniques on how to help someone through their step up. Everyone is their own individual. They've got their own way of teaching. Some people are going to appreciate your style. Some people are not gonna appreciate your style. See the comments for people who don't appreciate my style. You know, in the last year, I think a lot of people suddenly became aware of the fact that ACA doesn't work in class five for a different reason, but they also don't work here for a very good set of reasons as well. So there are gonna be people who say, well, the ACA would tell me this, that, and the other thing. Well, you know, I'm teaching an advanced paddler, not a intermediate, not a beginner. And if you want to play at this level, you're gonna have to give up some of the safety nets that are around you and really manage the head game as much as the actual abilities of the paddler. So what I'm doing here is taking someone who I already know has the skills to pay the bills and I am just making sure that they can perform at the top of their ability level on any given day. If I can accomplish that, 
I can make sure that people have a great time the overwhelming majority of the time.